My name is uh, Lindani Mkunu and uh, we are at the Royal Cape Yacht Club in Western Cape at the port of Cape Town inside the harbour. The boats you see behind me uh, are the boats of members of the Royal Cape Yacht Club and I work here as the Academy Manager and I also am the Transformation Officer of uh, South African Sailing and also am a bo um, board member of uh, South African um, Boat Builders Export Council, which is called SUBEX. Um, and uh, we are here today really to talk about this industry, which is the sailing industry, uh, the industry of boat building, uh, and the initiatives that we are doing here uh, in Cape Town, in the Western Cape, uh, to try and get people of all color, uh, specifically historically disadvantaged youth, into the space uh, to know about sailing, to know about boats, to know about boat building, uh, and to know about the various uh, careers that are available within this space. Maybe to, to start things off, um, it would be good to give a bit of a background uh, on myself and how do I find myself as a young black guy uh, in a predominantly white space? Um, how did I find myself here doing the work that I'm doing uh, and where I come from? So I'm born and bred in Guazulu Natal, so there is a bit of salt in my blood. Uh, from the sea of Durban, much warmer than the waters of Cape Town, which is, I prefer the warmer waters of Durban, but you know, we do what we can. Um, I'm born from a little township in Clermont, uh, it's called Clermont, and it's not far from Westville. Uh, those of you who know Westville University, my whole family is from there. Um, in my family, uh, I think. Definitely, there were professionals, black professionals, lawyers, doctors. Um, and uh, so that, I think, was my first exposure to, to, to professionalism of black people. My father worked at the University of Natal. So when I was young, I, I would go with him to the university and sit sometimes in lectures. So that's what I knew and I think that's what I was always thinking in my head as I was growing up that I'm, I'm going to become a lawyer uh, because my, my father was a lawyer and, and my mother also went into law and a lot of the black people that I saw around me uh, were in traditional um, you know, career paths uh, of law and accounting and engineering and um, you know, medicine and so I always obviously saw myself kind of fitting into that, into that mold as well and, um, uh, and becoming, you know, like, like what I see because that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's life. You, 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 you imitate, you mimic, uh, you, you emulate, um, you just copy that which you see as you grow up, whether it be your parents or your relatives or friends or extended family, but pretty much most of the time young people will follow what is in front of them, the examples that are in front of them. So when I, as I'm saying, when I was growing up, that was my, that was my vision, that was my goal. Um, and then I went to high schools and then went to varsity and in, sure indeed in varsity, it was law that was in my mind. Um, but. It didn't turn out that way. From law, I went into advertising and marketing, trying to find my way. And then from that, I found myself in aviation out of all places. And there I was in Eastern Cape uh, doing aviation. And I think 
that's the first time really I got close to water because we do some low level flying um, on the Eastern Cape Coast between Port Alfred and uh, Grahamstown or sometimes all the way from PE to East London. And I rather enjoyed it. I rather enjoyed, uh, you know, kind of flying over the water like that. It was really nice. Um, but still, nothing in that journey of mine had indicated that I would be here today, you know, talking about <laughs> water and talking about maritime and talking about boats and sailing. There was just no one in my vicinity. And I found it quite strange because um, there were lots of, you know, well-off, well-to-do black professionals in my vicinity. I think I grew up in probably a middle-class, upper-middle-class kind of black family in Johannesburg. Um, and I was exposed to the best that, you know, um, you can think of when it comes to, to black people. I had some really great role models in my life. Uh, judges and lawyers and accountants and you know captains of industry these are the people that I grew up around um, uh, but in no way in those circles was sailing or boating ever mentioned you know not even a friend of a friend so that's how far removed it was even from a black boy who was coming from you know middle class upper middle class black family exposed as far as I was concerned um, uh, but maybe to go back and then I, I you know go into aviation I get my PPL license and I think round about 2012 I go to Midrand in Johannesburg and I'm going to um, you know there's a it's, a, it's called the Grand Central. It's like a little um, airport there in Midrand, and, I, and, 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 and pilots and private pilots and so forth go there to um, write exams or renew their licenses and stuff like that. So I was there to, you know, renew my PPL license and stuff. And on my way back, I think it was my last exam or something. Um, I. Um, met this white gentleman on the train. I had an aviation book in my hand. And at the time, there was a Gau train, of course. And I was taking the Gau train, commuting home, because at that time, I lived in Ilovo. And uh, I was commuting from Midrand and going to Ilovo. And um, I then meet this gentleman on the train. You know, he sparks a conversation with me, because uh, he saw me with an aviation book. He asked me, you know, am I, am I into aviation, I tell them, yes, I am. You know, it's, it's one of my passions and stuff like that. Um, and then we get to talking about various things. And then he then mentions to me that he knows, uh, he has a friend and um, the, the son of the friend um, is a pilot and he also is a skipper and he delivers boats, uh, sailing yachts specifically around the world. This was, the first time, I must have been 27 or 28, somewhere there. The first time that I heard about sailing boats, sailing yachts. And it was from this, he must have been in his 50s, this white man. And he gave me his card. I was really intrigued by the whole thing. He gave me his card and he said, um, when you get home, drop me an email and I'll send you a link to a sailing school in Cape Town. So he sent me the link to the sailing school in Cape Town. I dropped him an email, he sent me the link to the sailing school in Cape Town. Um, as, and as they say, the rest was history because um, I'm just by nature a very curious person. And the next thing I knew, I was on an airplane flying to Cape Town and I booked myself onto a competent crew um, and to one of the sailing schools in Cape Town uh, to learn how to sail. And uh, before I knew it, uh, I was just hooked. Um, I think we went to Langaban, uh, off Mykonos Yacht Club in Langaban, and we got on a boat, they switched off the engine, and they gave me, you know, the wheel, the helm, which is what we call, and just that sensation of, you know, the sound of water and wind, and this whole thing, like, moving 
under the propulsion of just wind alone, uh, for me was enough. Um, I was hooked. And I spent, I think, the next year and a half or a couple of months uh, learning really how to sail, sailing, doing night sailing, getting all the courses that were necessary. So I went from knowing absolutely nothing, competent crew, to uh, yacht master level offshore, uh, which are just some of the qualifications that you get in sailing. And, and this ticket was going to allow me to be able to cross the high seas and sail from Cape Town to America if, if necessarily. But that was only the beginning of the journey. Uh, once, obviously, I had gotten the qualifications, I then needed to go and get experience. And my first work job would be for a company called Robertson and Kane. They had a management company that they used uh, when they sold their boats. So Robertson and Kane is, is one of the biggest boat builders in the country. In fact, I think the biggest by volume. Uh, they happened to launch most of their boats um, from land to sea, from here, from the Royal Cape Yacht Club. And at that time, in 2013, I think, they, would, they were selling boats to the American market, the Caribbean, um, and those boats would be then built here in Cape Town, and then from here, from the waterfront, a crew would be assembled with a skipper and a mate and a deckhand, and that crew would then deliver that boat to the various destinations around the world. And this was my first introduction to traveling the freeway of the sea and realizing just how incredible it is to leave four-man crew on a small boat and you leave from Cape Town and you travel for over 6,000 nautical miles, sometimes over 34 days out on the water traveling from Cape Town to America. It was a life-changing uh, experience because I'd, I'd traveled the world you know, before at that time, but I was using airplanes. Um, so <laughs> with an airplane you take at most 17 hours from South Africa to, to New York and uh, you know you arrive there quickly you have no sense of your environment outside of you you're in a cabin really with wings and you're just flying at incredible speeds and before you know it you you're in another continent you've crossed the sea but for the first time in my life I was very much aware of the journey. It was traveling to America was a journey. It was a journey that was going to take us days. Um, and more than anything else, it was an introduction to just how big the ocean is. And to understand it, not to know it in a figurative sense, but or in a metaphorical sense when they tell you 70% of this planet is water. When you get on the sea and you travel from you know, the southernmost part of the African continent and you cross the Atlantic, you go past St. Helena, Ascension Islands, Cape Verde, you go and you cross and your first meeting with the Caribbean islands is you know, St. Lucia, Barbados, and you go in to St. Martin and you go further. You know, Every single piece of land you're seeing on the water is like, it's a process of unlearning because you've never been, it's like almost being out in space. You've never been in an environment like that where every day you wake up, every day you sleep, there's water. There's the sound of water. You go to sleep, you hear water. You, you wake up, you hear water. You look outside, you see water. So you're your whole interaction with water just changes and it becomes your world. And for those, for that month and a half, whether it takes you six months or it takes you two months or however long you spend at sea, but for that time where you have absolutely no reference to land, there's no cars, there's no buildings, there's no trees, there's no, it's just water. That's all you see. It, it, it's, it's quite a special thing. And to arrive, in a destination where you would normally come there by a plane or by a car and you see if you're coming like you come over Cape Town you just see the Table Mountain you see you know so your view also just changes because 
you arrive at a place and then the first thing you see, you see an outline of the land. You just see like a profile. And it keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger the closer you get. That on its own is just, it's kind of like a mind bending thing. Um, and, it, and it changes the way you look at the world, the way you see the world, but also it expands your kind of thinking in terms of what's the territory that you as a human being should be a part of on this planet. Most of the time our radius as human beings is maybe 10, 20 kilometers. You go to work, you go home, you go to work, you go home, you come back. But the sea, once you're out there and you see how vast it is, you realize that there's actually a bigger playing field that's out there and it's water. And there are a lot of people who have interaction with water. I'd say white people have had more interaction than we've had with water. They've explored the world, they've conquered it, they've colonized it through water. Um, South Africa today is diverse because wind and water brought white people here. It allowed them to be able to come here. So there's this interaction I think that's missing from just the way black people live and the way they do their life and the way they live their life and the way they plan their life and the way they see themselves. There's no incorporation of water anywhere in their thinking. Maybe the only time that we have a certain interaction with water is when we have our spiritual healers, Izango Ma and Abandaba Mazayoni, who go and, and, and they pray at the sea or they pray at the river. Uh, or we have little kids who live in rural areas who go sometimes and swim in the river and drown. Um, just that, that we have so many drownings, already tells you that we have not prepared ourselves for the element of water. And to think that it's such a vast element, it, it makes up such a huge part of this very planet that we live on. It makes such a huge part of just our physical body. There's 70% of us is water. I think we've missed something. And that's why I tell the story because I'm trying to say that it almost took me my whole life to understand that one of the things that I'm supposed to do while I'm here on this planet is to have interaction namans with water. I have to, it's almost imperative. Water is like my oxygen. There's something that I'm supposed to get there, let alone the career parts that are available and all of that, but just me as a human being, there's something that I'm supposed to do with water, to interact with water on a daily basis, if not at least once a month or twice a month. So to fast forward, um, and then I did a few trips uh, to the Caribbean, I did a few trips uh, Indian Ocean, I did, a, I did a trip to Australia. So I did a I did, a, I did a lot of travel for about a couple of years, just on water, traveling to different parts of the world, destinations, until eventually I found myself then living on an island that I didn't even know, or like a group of islands that I didn't know even existed, just off the west coast of Africa, uh, 600 miles um, north west of Senegal. And these islands were called the Cape Verdean Islands. So it was a country called Cape Verde. And I got work there to work there as a first mate on a, on a big sailing yacht. And there was this young South African boy who lived in a Portuguese speaking country where they spoke Creole. And water brought me there because I spent most of my time working on the boat, taking people out, sailing them around the island, learned a bit of Portuguese. And yet again, this was a place that I would have never thought of maybe flying to if water had not taken me to this place. So there's a lot of places in the world, islands and all sorts of places that exist where you can only really reach them by getting on the biggest freeway there is, and that is the freeway of the sea. And my time in Cape Verde was absolutely incredible. I met so many different people. Um, I, I did such interesting things there. Uh, and again, my relationship with the water was solidified. 
And then I left Cape Verde, and when I left Cape Verde, I then came to Cape Town, where in Cape Town then I met some people, and they were interested in me running what is called the Royal Cape Yacht Club Sailing Academy. And uh, this is then when my journey started uh, on embarking to bring people of color, specifically the youth, from coloreds to Indians to black people, to come to the water, to have a relationship with water. And I knew the challenges that were there because there were historical challenges, social economic challenges, uh, spatial planning uh, challenges. Um, for instance, if you look at the Cape Flats uh, and you think about Cape Town, you think about Kemp's Bay, you think about um, Milneton, all those places where there are beaches and there's water, um, people of color are quite removed, far away from the water. Uh, the, they don't have access to water. If we are here now in the harbor, you need, there's security in the harbor, there's, there's access cards. How does just a child from Kailich or Kukuletu stumble and fall or stray, you'll get lost and end up here by the water, by the yacht club, on a boat. It won't happen on its own. So then you queue in organizations like ours, you queue in people like myself who are taking the initiative and putting in interventions that are intentional, that bring kids from the townships, from Guguletu, from Kailicha, from Mitchell's Plain, Gales River, uh, you name it, Philippi, um, and bring them to this place that they would otherwise never be a part of. So this is how then the CSI project came about where really the Yacht Club said, how do we reach out onto the wider community of Cape Town? How do we share this special uh, blessing and privilege that we have to be able to have water literally on our doorstep every day and have boats to be able to go out there and table bay and sail as much as we want and enjoy this, this beautiful pastime? How do we share this with everyone? And this is how the Academy was born. And I guess this is how my purpose was kind of formed before I even arrived. And I really grabbed it with both hands because in all my travels, as I spoke before, I happened to be the only black guy sometimes in marinas. If I came into to harbors or, or marinas with a boat, a beautiful boat, the first question that the authorities would ask me is, where's the owner of the boat? Where did you get this boat from? So there's always an element of suspicion. And that was caused because those people had never seen or were not used to seeing people who look like me, of my color, sailing boats, sailing expensive boats, um, moving in those parts of the world. So what needed to happen is that we needed to create critical mass, not just from South Africa, but from Africa, wherever we're missing, wherever we're not represented, then we need to grow those numbers. And I'm sure there's lots of fields like that in many industries, but this is the one where I am, and this is the one where I have the power to do something about it. So that's what became a personal mission, then became a mission of many people. It became a collaborative vision um, between the likes of the Royal Cape Yacht Club and the various funders that we've been able to get on board um, to help us with this, 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 this vision, this mission that we're on of, of trying to get young kids, black kids, to be able to see themselves um, on the water, to be able to see themselves as captains of boats, to be able to see themselves, whether it be a young girl or a young boy, it doesn't matter, but they look at the sea and they see themselves there, they see themselves doing something there. It, it doesn't remain foreign, it doesn't remain something that they're afraid of, but it, remain, but it, it starts to become slowly a playground. They see the ocean as a playground the same way that kids who play basketball see the court as a playground, kids who play soccer see the field as a playground, kids who play cricket see you know, the field as a playground. We want to turn the ocean into a playground too for many, many kids. And so 
This program really aims at doing that. We provide the boats, we provide the transport, we provide the kit, we provide the food, we provide pretty much everything. And all we ask of the youngsters is commitment. Of course, it does help to have a background in mathematics and physics because sailing is physics in a way, to use the elements of the wind acting on the sails, you know, how the boat is designed, how it interacts with the water, all of that, how it floats, how it remains upright, how it's balanced, all those are, are all that that's physics, that's geometry, that's, you know, it's, so it's, it, 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 it's, it, it, it helps to come from that background to understand these, these elements and to be able to, 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 to apply them here on, 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 on water, on sailing. The bigger picture in all of this, um, maybe to kind of tie a ribbon around everything, is I think around about 2014, the government came up with a, a drive to create numerous, numerous jobs and call this the blue economy, the ocean's economy. And the policy was put in place called Operation Pagisa. Operation Pagisa then kind of gave birth to a lot of agencies, government agencies that would then create skills development within that ocean's economy. Because if we're going to have an ocean's economy in South Africa, then somebody has to deliver it. There has to be capacity for it. And that's where I think we fall in. We fall in to that pipeline of creating young, vibrant, qualified, ready to go, people of color, women and men alike, um, in that ocean's economy. I think us as a sailing school, as a sailing academy, we want to say if we're going to create professionals who are going to go and do work out at sea, whether it be oil rigs, cruise liners, tankers, the first thing that we'd like them to do is to have a relationship with water, is to have a relationship with the sea. So we get great support from the likes of TITA, which is the Transport Education and Training Authority, we get great support from SAIMI, which is the South African International Maritime Institute. We get great support from the likes of the Lotto. We get great support from the private sector, uh, companies that we work with. And really the whole drive is to try and, as I said, make the ocean a playground for the black child.